It's a pleasure to be here specifically with, uh, or particularly with the, uh, the panel that we have amassed, uh, some of the leading thinkers uh, in legal, uh, the legal uh, evolution of open source uh, over the last uh, 30 plus years. Um, this is no longer a baby, this is a mature movement and it's one that, uh, that I'm proud to be part of. Uh, and uh, we won't uh, spend a lot of time introducing uh, the panelists. Um, you should know who they are um, by being able to look in the program. Uh, what I wanted to do is briefly um, introduce the topic. Uh, what we wanted to do is go back to be able to go forward to make sure that we're all on the same page. This is a, a, a highly volatile and evolutionary community where new people are joining all the time, and we want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, those of us who are in government, those of us who are, who are actually in, private, in the private sector uh, should all have a common cognitive ground on where open source is and where it's going. Uh, and what we wanted to do is, is start by kind of looking fundamentally to inform the perspective, remind some, reacquaint some of the audience with certain fundamental truths related to open source. Um, Open source is a wholly unique and invaluable modality. I've, I've always focused on this. It's the way we create value in the new economy that's so important, and open source provides this ability through collaborative technology development for one plus one plus one, not to equal three, but to equal six or 10 or 20, when we bring smart people together from all around the world to be able to solve problems in, in uh, software. Uh, the concept of universal reciprocity, which is near and dear to my heart because it's something that's Im embedded and Im 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 uh, empowers the, uh, the op Open Invention Network community, which I manage. Uh, universal reciprocity is a widely accepted pro-competitive um, pro approach to patent risk mitigation that fosters a permissionless and frictionless ecosystem and encourage ac encourages active adoption of new technology. It is, uh, in fact, a fundamental linchpin of open collaboration that is embodied in the OIN license and the IP policies of various open source projects. And very importantly, uh, it's a concept that has been validated as pro-competitive by competition authorities uh, here in Europe, uh, specifically in Germany as well, and Japan and China and the US, dating back to the 2011 CPTN transaction. Uh, where uh, each of these countries and regions, uh, regulatory authorities looked at the OIN license carefully. Open source is underpinned by a mature licensing regime and legal foundation that embraces diversity inclusivity and inclusivity through highly innovative global open source projects. Uh, there are unequivocal regional, national, global economic benefits of open source that have been chronicled uh, by by Mirko and others who have, who have analyzed this issue for, uh, for a number of years. Open source is pro-competitive and accommodative of standards development and adoption. Coexistence of open and proprietary has led the most sophisticated among us to participate in what I call a form of practice duality where both concepts are accepted and embraced. Uh, internalizing the duality of open and proprietary has been embraced by literally thousands of companies who have become OIN, Open Invention Network licensees, and in so doing have embraced universal reciprocity. Many of these companies are among the largest patent holders in the world, and some such as AT&T, IBM, Sony, Philips, and Technicolor have historically been and remain the most active global patent monetizers. Uh, Long-held myths around patents equating to innovation for companies and nations is the product of fundamentally flawed thinking, as is evidenced by IBM's recent announcement that it will no longer seek numerical patent leadership and will instead use a combination of open source and proprietary technology approaches to practice meaningful innovation that translates ideas to shareholder value. It is not a coincidence that IBM came to this realization after acquiring Red Hat, the most successful open source company in history. Serious economic analysis is now shining a light on the true nature of innovation and how the modality of collaborative development that underlies open source is a foundational element fueling economic growth in an increasingly software-centric world. And finally, 30 plus years into its history as an innovation platform, open source has and continues to change the way we create value in the new economy. Uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to Karen to talk about uh, where we've come from and provide some foundational elements around how the open source community has evolved to the point it's at now. Sure. And I'm humbled to be in front of this audience and, uh, and, and talk about this and realize that we could tell the story of open source from many different perspectives and they would all be interesting and rich. 
I mean, we could talk about it from the developer perspective. And the developers are among the most valuable human beings on the planet because we have very few people that understand the way the systems work on, that uh, we are all dependent upon. And open source is one way to make the best use of those very rare and valuable resources. So we could talk about why developers are very supportive of, of uh, open source. We could talk about uh, many other aspects. We could go back to Richard's, uh, Stallman's original uh, approach. But I want to talk specifically about why corporations actually do this and what is important about that. Because it's both the, the uh, individual developers and the corporate resources that have made this the truly incredible uh, transformation that we've seen. People, uh, I still have people, you know, when they get assigned to open source in a corporation and they don't know anything about it, they think they've been sent to the charity uh, arm, you know, that, that, well, nobody really makes any money on that. We still hear that. Let me tell you, the corporations get involved in open source not out of any sort of altruistic idea that they should be doing something better for the planet, although I wish that was a, a driver. They do it because it is absolutely essential to them in building the infrastructure that is necessary for every industry on Earth. We talk about software, but this is true in every industry. The roads and the bridges and the infrastructure that is necessary for all of the companies to perform and to compete and to develop uh, are, are, de are, are some things that should not and cannot be built alone. And more importantly, they cannot be maintained alone. So it's this su sense of vulnerability and dependency that brings them together in a platform that enables them to collaborate and to build these things together. But the magic that we learned from the developers who were the first to the table with these concepts uh, could be killed. <laughs> because if we don't understand why and how corporations come together, we can change the underpinnings in ways that prevent them from collaborating in the ways that they want and need to. And we've already heard today a number of times the word trust. And we've also heard the word permissionless. And we've also talked about speed. These three elements are absolutely essential to the success of open source projects. When the projects come from independent corporate efforts and into a community, the reason they're doing that is because they want to engage a broader community, a wide base of participation, and they want to do it quickly. Deciding that you're going to do it to build something that might be relevant or interesting five years from now or when we've all negotiated the agreements or when we've all negotiated this is not interesting, compelling, or useful. But being able to use an open source license that everybody has seen and understood and used before and that doesn't have anything sneaking around in the corners or edges that might be uh, uh, advantageous to one party and not to the other, the value of that license as the basis for that development of infrastructure cannot be overstated. And, and that trust, that permissionless trust that global permissionless trust that is established, that we're all in this together on the same terms without the delay of having to negotiate that, and knowing that no one is sitting on the sidelines waiting to benefit in a way that is more or different, that is absolutely essential to these infrastructure projects. And we may have thought that they were, you know, they were edge a few years ago and that will anybody really do this? I know I, I heard that all the time. Nobody really does, nobody really makes any money for that stuff, you know. That we're so far beyond that when we look at the number of projects, the size of the projects, the number of participants, the, uh, the uh, amount of funding that goes into this, we now know that this is the way to build the infrastructure of the future. But permissionless, trusted environments are absolutely essential, not just to individuals, but to the companies that come together to build these platforms. And Thanks very much, Karen. <laughs> Thank you.
What I wanted to do now is the, the only economist on the panel, uh, Mirko, um, because, he, the, because he's at so many legal events, I forget that, and because of his, uh, his ability to understand the legal issues so well, I forget that his fundamental background is in economics. But uh, he's done a series of, uh, of pieces and studies over the years, and uh, we wanted him to talk about the economics of open source and, and how benefits are accruing uh, and have accrued over the last 30 plus years. Thank you. So first, I was very pleased to see the results of the recent study that OFE and Andrew and me have worked on, on Hans Holtz um, slides. I wanted to highlight that um, we very carefully uh, calculated the impact of open source on the European economy as a lower bound. So it's at least that. It is probably more. Um, in, in terms of the um, economic foundations of open source, I think there are a couple of aspects to highlight. One, it is an alternative way to develop um, technical innovations um, to the established ways like patenting that we've heard before, which means um, it offers a choice to participants to pick the model that they see fits their needs best. And we've seen that collaboration is a model that many prefer and therefore I think the, um, the predominant way of collaboration in the software industry today is via open source. So it's a choice, um, it's a voluntary decision by all the participants and as such um, it represents the most established way of innovating in the, um, in the tech sector, um, the software tech sector. And, um, that illustrates and underlines the point that Keith made that we cannot simply assess innovation anymore by counting the number of patents. It is really an important point that we have to, have to unfortunately repeat, feels to me like every year more than once. Um, but as you said, there are a couple of uh, publications now that illustrate this topic and others in a lot of detail on open source and standardization, on the economic impact, um, and only uh, recently uh, an open access textbook on open source law and practice, um, where, for example, we've delved into a lot of detail on why the question, how do I make money with open source, is really the one question to ask. Um, open source provides benefits um, way beyond simply making money. It provides benefits like cost savings across uh, large industry verticals, um, which in the bottom line of a company have exactly the same effect. You don't need to have earnings. You can also save costs to improve your, um, your profitability. Um, the reduction of redundant effort um, of, of parallel development, similar to in the classic uh, literature, the patent race, where you have multiple entities trying to invent the same thing, and the first pass the goalpost wins, and everybody else is in the dust. Uh, that is, is a cost of the old way of innovating that we get rid of with open source. So it's quite clear that if you um, basically draw an equation of what are the benefits and the costs that you have from collaborating, collaborating open source, that the overall benefit is positive, both at the microeconomic level and also at the uh, macroeconomic level. With this, I think it's clear um, that open source is a pro-competitive force. Um, this combination of um, voluntary participation and the open licensing of results basically eliminates the opportunity of an individual player to unduly influence others. Um, and it invi invites everybody with very low barriers of entry to participate. Um, the, the cost to participate, the initial barrier is very low. Um, and we see this in, for example, the higher engagement of small and medium-sized companies um, in, in the open source space. Um, and this is related to Astor's point earlier, that European companies are mostly challengers. And there are many small and medium-sized innovative companies that are challenging the incumbents. And open source enables them to do so. Um, another aspect is maturity at this point. Um, I think it was mentioned a couple of times. We're not talking about something new. We're talking about three decades by now. We're talking about the predominant model of the software industry to innovate. And we have policy makers and others in the room today, which are kind of also highlights that. But this also means that we need to reiterate another point, reiterate another point, and that is open source is a term of art. It is a well understood model. There is um, a, a global governance system in place that, that steers and protects it. And uh, anybody who tries to redefine what open source means or um, questions uh, the basic tenets, like the freedoms embodied in open source licenses, um, to me probably is opening a can of worms that should remain closed. 
So thank you. I think that's the initial overview. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mirko. Uh, and now I'd like to have Andrew talk about uh, standards and open source. Yeah, thanks very much, Keith. I think uh, the theme uh, that both Karen uh, and Mirko have uh, relied upon really has been more about reduction of friction than anything else. The success of open source and the innovation that is derived from open source has been very much about the reduction of friction. And Karen said we're permissionless quite a lot. And the creation of a permissionless environment um, has allowed, for example, uh, we were going to have a quotation up here, it's not there, uh, from Sir Tim Berners-Lee, and he, he talks about, um, you know, I think we can all agree that the World Wide Web is possibly the most economically impactful embodiment of uh, innovation in human history. Many people would, would agree with that as a statement. Um, and he says this was only possible because of the permissionless environment in which he was off operating. He didn't have to get the permission of DARPA to use the internet. He didn't have to get the permission of Vint Cerf, uh, for example. So to build on top of the World Wide Web has also been a highly permissionless environment. And by permissionless, we are not talking about an absence of patents, we're not talking about an absence of intellectual property rights, and I think uh, Karen was talking earlier about some of the preconceptions uh, that people have um, about the open source and the free software movement. Um, and yes, there are parts of that uh, where uh, you know, people are obviously reevaluating the impact of intellectual property rights the whole time, but we live in an environment um, where they do exist. So, the uh, permissionless in this context really means that anyone who wants to participate does not have to, and as Karen said, enter into negotiations with another par party in order to do that. They need to be able to get a, get, uh, go ahead and do what they really want to do, which is to innovate. And there have been a number of other areas of friction. Um, so, uh, for example, the ability to uh, cooperate with one another um, has been improved dramatically uh, by the fact that people can use platforms based on Git, like GitHub and GitLab, for example, so that's one particular example. Uh, the availability of um, free and open source software tools so that the development process, that has reduced friction as well. So all of these potential barriers to entry um, are being steadily eroded, and that is a huge boost to innovation. But in order for innovation to thrive, there needs to be interoperability between all the various components. Uh, and this has been a core of um, European Union policy uh, for, a, for a very long time. Um, I mean, if we talk about the uh, current um, 2020 to 2023 open source strategy, um, then the European Union says that interoperability is of the utmost importance to the Commission and to Member States. And the key to interoperability is to have open standards. So the standards uh, in all levels that are available, are, it's of vital importance that, um, uh, and again, it, it's, it's, it's reduction of friction again, because if um, you want to uh, take a particular, a couple of particular components, and you want to um, combine them, or you, you uh, want to uh, be able to improve that particular component, it's always going to be significantly easier to do that if you are developing to a particular standard. And, uh, there's a number of uh, different mechanisms in which way standards can come about. Sometimes they arise um, de facto, um, simply because uh, the development process has led to those, uh, those standards emerging, um, and then they can follow through various standards processes with the standard setting organizations, um, such as um, um, ISO, um, ITU, um, IC, etc. Um, then you have organizations like W3C, and they have uh, different approaches towards intellectual property again. And this brings us back to this idea of a uh, permissionless environment um, in which it's possible to implement these standards without having to obtain specific permission from people through a negotiated license. And this is one of the areas that I'm working on in research at the moment, is to research how um, it's, it's easier for companies to, interop uh, to, to operate in these areas, because um, I think in some areas, standards are um, lagging behind other areas of open source, uh, in that it's not always permissionless and that uh, there are um, frequently um, issues, for example, with the ISO 
uh, standard patent policy, uh, which means that um, although uh, people who hold patents are able to uh, declare those patents, um, and indeed they can, uh, they can declare that they're available um, on a royalty-free basis, um, there is still a phase which is unnecessary, in my view, uh, which um, occasionally requires negotiation with those organizations. Um, but um, from a positive perspective, um, it's undoubtedly the case there's a number of uh, very impressive initiatives happening at the moment in the world of open source. Open source is uh, taking into uh, uh, it, it, it's, its, own, um, its own sphere uh, mechanisms um, for uh, increasing the speed and the effectiveness uh, with which standardization can happen. Um, and the, the uh, rapidity with which the open chain standard, for example, um, uh, managed to reach ISO standardization um, at the end of 2021. Um, yeah, is, is, uh, is, is a very impressive example of that. Um, so, um, you know, final note, I think it's positive uh, the way that standardization is going, but we do have a little, little bit of a way to go at the moment. Thanks very much. Appreciate it, Andrew. And now uh, we've given Carlo the, uh, the difficult task of reflecting on 30 years of, uh, of history, the key points and observations that he's had with the incredible diversity of client base that he's served. Thank you, thank you. Actually, I, I was planning on touching upon a few things. Uh, we have spoken about uh, large companies, small companies, but the community at large is made by much more than this. We have individuals. Uh, never, uh, always remember that Linux was initiated by a, a person, Linux Torvalds, uh, the W3C, uh, so, sorry, the World War Web was initiated by a person, Tim Berners-Lee, and uh, Free Software Foundation was funded by Richard Stallman. So we have uh, uh, also grassroots movements that are uh, functional to producing and to controlling and to helping the, the working of open source. And I have happened to uh, be a counsel to the Free Software Foundation Europe, and now I'm serving in the board of uh, the Open Source Initiative. OSI has one task, it uh, is to, uh, one mission, I would say, to, to foster open source, and we also have a, a, a list of approved licenses. These licenses, by and large, operate under copyright, but licenses are not open source. Uh, and I, I want to touch upon another point that was already made, but it's important. Uh, open source and licenses are a means to an end. An end is to ensure that everybody is able to use, study, modify, and distribute software in a permissionless way. And by permissionless, I mean under any possible rights that, uh, that are controlled by anybody. Because um, uh, this is a game of equals. There mustn't be anyone who is more equal than others. Uh, and you cannot just give freedom with one hand and take it away with another hand. And Actually, I'm saying that because there is a lot of open washing going around, of people take, is saying this is open source because this is a, some copyright permission. This is not enough, because that's not a game of equals. And this is a travesty of open source. It's very important. And of course, we can have different opinions as to whether patents belong in open source. I have strong views. But this is the game we are playing. And the, the game is that there are patent uh, companies uh, holding and organizations holding a lot of patents. And we need to make sure that this is not gained against uh, the equality of open source. So we, uh, whatever our opinion is, we welcome very much that large companies and uh, institutions put those patents uh, uh, at the uh, service of, 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 uh, of open source, and they do pledges, do uh, covenants to, 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 to permit that people are uh, operating in a safe harbor where nobody is exploiting. Of course, uh, this requires three things, and one has already been said, that this, this is permanent. There is no carpet pulling, that you have a liberty and then all of a sudden the floor is vanishing from your, from your feet. That requires that patents, uh, as long as the system stays this way, the patents are, uh, are not waived, but preserve their uh, right to be enforced. Because if they are licensed, they are given away under certain conditions, certain, this condition must work for everybody. And this brings to the final point, reciprocity. 
Without reciprocity, you, are, uh, you have a safe harbor when somebody has the right uh, to, 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 to fire against the enemy. So when the U United Nations establishes a, 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 a ceasefire zone, they send in the, the, the blue helmets. I happen to be one of them. Uh, and they control that nobody uh, uh, fires uh, at the enemy, because otherwise it would be a, a slant game. So uh, reciprocity means that these, uh, the, the, the patents are used in, uh, uh, to preserve the uh, permissionless environment. It's, this is very important, uh, short of any other policy action. A final remark, um, uh, open source is complex, is counterintuitive. We have been preaching in the desert for 30 years, uh, saying that it's, it's also a viable uh, uh, business system. Uh, recently, we have been proven to be, to be right. But it's an alignment of stars, which is very unique, and it's very easily disrupted. And we have already seen areas where open source struggles because of the surrounding environment. And I can quote at least two. One is in Europe, the radio-defined software. It's, uh, it's been heavily impacted by um, unwise decisions in, in, uh, in, uh, in, by policymakers. And the other is uh, the elephant in the room is the audio-video codex, which is a, a heavily patented. And until recently, a open source couldn't, couldn't, couldn't be here. So uh, please, when we flag if there is an issue, if you are a legislator, if you are a, um, a policymaker, please give us the benefit of doubt that we might be right. Thank you very much, Carla. I would like to extend on this idea of reciprocity a little bit because I believe that it is misunderstood to a large extent in, in the discussions about open source. Uh, we often hear that there are certain licenses that require responsibility from the users of the software, and therefore we see some sort of re uh, reciprocity um, in, in, the, in the ecosystem. I think this is really looking at the, um, the idea from exactly the wrong perspective. Um, the, the idea of reciprocity in open source is the modeling of collaboration as a social exchange. And um, the reason why it was so natural for the people who wrote the original copyleft licenses to put reciprocity into them is that they assumed that to be in place anyway. And the case in point for that is that you, if you look at pretty much all recent major industry collaborations that are really at a large scale, they're all very much using permissive licensing schemes. Um, however, you see a very strong sense of reciprocity there. So you do not have a legal requirement to act this way. You have a community norm in the, uh, in the group that participates that reciprocity is the foundation of our work. There is an economic foundation, an economic theory that explains this, um, but I think in the, in the context of open source, it is really important to understand that this permissionless environment that we talked about depends on all actors understanding the, the governance norms in the space that they're operating in, and adjust to them. Um, and uh, it, it is also known that a single actor that doesn't play by the rules um, causes oversized damage because they're changing how others are willing to collaborate. They're poisoning the well. Um, and I think when we are talking about policy making in open source, um, it is important that these basic tenets are understood um, so that we can reinforce and encourage the intended way of collaboration and ideally put fences around that and protect it. It is a very successful model. It has a very positive impact on, on our liberties and on the economy. Um, so it's worth protecting and we need to do it the right way. So thanks for that. Karen, did you have a... No, I, I'm just nodding and verbal nodding and verbal nodding. And the other thing that you said that I thought was so important um, was looking at this from the perspective of small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, the, the platforms that are created, the infrastructure that's built, is a ben great benefit to them. Uh, and, and the larger companies certainly benefit from it. They come together and, and build that infrastructure. But in my experience, the real uh, boon has been to these small companies that can enter a space with security, can, uh, can operate with uh, and get investment based on a set of norms, 
and, uh, and thrive. And that's been a wonderful thing to see. Just going back to this concept of permissionless, so when Mirko was talking, um, another thing uh, occurred to me. And uh, we often overlook um, the, uh, the sociological aspect that uh, drives the dynamics behind the economics of open source. And I think something that's been extremely important um, and was referred to earlier as well is with the uh, development, uh, for example, of OSPOs throughout Europe, this provides examples um, for any organization that wants to embark on open source development and that's whether a commercial organization, whether uh, they're in the public sector, whether in the academia or, or whatever. It grants a form of permission because you are no longer regarded as being doing something unusual and that's not the norm. If the government is doing it, if it's supporting it, if it's seen to be working effectively, then it's much easier for you as an individual in one of these organizations to say, we should open source this because it's not the weird thing to do, it's the thing that works and it's the thing that has been, been seen to work. And I've, I've been involved, there are, there, are, there are really two ways of encouraging open, open source development. There's the, there's the, um, uh, uh, the top-down approach, um, which in some ways I suppose embody themselves. They say, this is how we're going to do it. Uh, but there's a bottom-up approach as well, which is just empowering individuals to be able to say, this is the way we want to do things because it works. And it might, it might not work, and that's fine. Frequently, very frequently, it does. So I think the very existence um, of uh, you know these excellent initiatives um, from the um, European Union, the idea of encouraging the development of OSPOs throughout the member states, um, is a very positive one from that perspective as well. I have very little to add, which uh, of uh, the rest of the panel, I might remind that. Um, and this is also my personal experience as a lawyer, in, in, also, uh, in addition to, be, to being a, a, an activist in open source and free software. Uh, innovation happens everywhere. So you, don't, uh, you cannot limit your views to a big research uh, center or a big company. Uh, innovation can come from small, medium enterprises, very innovative. I have a, a number of uh, very interesting projects uh, run in, in, uh, in many different ways. Uh, academia is also important. Of course, there are research centers in, in academia that are very important. And, and uh, doing it in, the, in an open source fashion is a big equalizer. Everybody is a free ticket to enter. Of course, you have to play, you have to contribute significantly. Otherwise, uh, in an open source, you're easily spot as a, as a, um, uh, somebody who is just dragging their feet and, and just uh, exploiting others. But uh, this is one of the beauty of uh, my experience. Experience. I've been not as, as, as much as, as the others in the room, but I've been in this business for uh, a quarter of a century now, and I've seen it happening over and over. And I've seen small companies uh, uh, adding to uh, a very large project and, and, and taking over control of certain technology and be very helpful. This is thanks to the uh, equality that the open source and the, the social and legal system uh, together creates in this environment. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel for, uh, for their ideas, their thoughts, their, the history that, uh, that's created, the perspectives that you, you, you've listened to today. I've had the good fortune of being around for the past 15 years, and uh, uh, it's a really, uh, I'm proud to be part of this community. Open source is a gift, and I think we all have to recognize, my final comment, that that as, as the caretakers of this gift, whether we're part of government, whether we're part of industry, whether we're the, 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 the legal guardians, the economic analysts, um, we're all part of something that's so much bigger than us. We need to recognize what we're part of and treat it with the respect and the dignity that it deserves if we want it to flourish and be able to support us going into the future uh, as an incredibly powerful source of innovation, the likes of which we've never seen. Thank you. <laughs>